How you doing, Rock family? Happy Sunday, happy Sunday. I'm Miles Pearson, pastor of the Rock Church. Welcome to church today. We are so excited. I'm excited. Hopefully you're excited for this message and how the Holy Spirit is going to challenge you. How he's going to challenge you. Let's get on our knees and pray. Let's get on our knees and pray. And I know it's like, man, he's getting on our knees. I'm going to do it every week. So just get a pillow, something, put on your knees. But we're going to pray and we're going to pray that God prepare our hearts for what he is going to say and how he is going to challenge us today in this series. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Lord, I pray for the people right now sitting on their couch, laying in their bed. I pray that they wouldn't shortcut their relationship with you. If we're not faithful in little things, we won't be faithful in the big things. So I pray they roll out of bed, roll off the couch real quick, get on the knees, even if it's one knee. And we just want to humble ourselves before you and tell you, ask you to speak to us, tell you that we submit to you. We want you to speak to us. We want you to challenge us. We don't want to check the box on Sunday. We want to be transformed into, into Jesus' image. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go. I got my Cole Hans on. Come on, look at my shoes. These are like sneakers. I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Cole Hans, the most comfortable shoes. I wish I had a contract. I'm not getting any endorsement money. I just bought these. These are awesome. Awesome. Let's get your Bibles out. Let's get your Bibles out. On the count of three, say word. One, two, three, say word. Let's turn to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. And this is going to be especially important for all of y'all who have jobs outside of a church, which is most of y'all. Because God has put you there for something very powerful. It's awesome. Nehemiah chapter 1. Have you ever had somebody either come up to you and share with you a story and then you say, I'll pray for you, or you share a story with them and they say they'll pray for you? Okay, someone shares, I, I mean, I deal with this all the time. Hey, I'll pray for you. I'll say that to them. Or they'll say, hey, Pastor Miles, I'll pray for you. And they'll say it to me. The question is, do you really do it? Now, so I, I, a lot of times I'll do it right there. Like I'll be in the airport and I'll be talking to somebody or in the store and someone will share their story with me. You know, I'm, I'm buying, you know, some, uh, some Lay's potato chips, which is my favorite Lay's potato chip. And someone will hey, Pastor Miles, hey, can I tell you? And they tell me, they pour their heart out and I go, hey, um, can I pray for you right now? And especially if I meet some people who aren't from the church, but they just know me from whatever, and I, or I'll talk to them, I'll say, how are you doing? And then I'll say, can I pray for you? And they don't, they're like, okay, and they start walking away. They're like, no, no, let's do it right now. And then before they can walk away and kind of get weirded out, because it's kind of awkward praying in public, I'll just, bam, <laughs> and right, they're, they're done. It's like, they're like, oh, I can't move. But, but do you pray for people after you leave? It's called intercession interceding, standing in the gap where God is here, people are here, and you are a bridge builder praying on behalf of someone else. We're in part two of a series called Burden of Proof. And if you are a believer, what is the proof or evidence that God's burden is your burden? What is the evidence or proof that God's preoccupation is your preoccupation? And one of those that we're going to talk about today is that you are an intercessor. You intercede for people. In other words, there are people struggling over here. God is looking for people who will pray and respond to those prayers and pray on behalf of those people. And that's one of the evidences that God's burden is your burden. Because if you, if, you, if you meet somebody and they pour their heart out to you and you say, yeah, I'll pray for you, and you never pray for them, what's up with that? You, not only did you give them your word, they need your prayers. And God, is, God wants you to pray for them. God wants to intercede because when you pray, something's going to happen in you and stuff's going to happen in them and, and other people's lives. But when, God, when, 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 when you pray, God's going to unite your hearts. So if you say you're going to pray for someone, you're saying, I'm going to enter into the spiritual battle on your behalf. 
And if God's burden is your burden, and that's the burden of proof, if, there, if, if, if God's burden is on your heart, the proof, one of the proofs is that you are going to be an intercessor. Hebrews 7.25 says Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. Jesus is praying for you. See that at the right hand of the Father, he's praying for you. Ain't that, that's encouraging to know. He's praying for you. He's rooting for you. The angels are looking into your life going, man, we, you know, let's go. Let's go. You got angels assigned to you that are dispatched from heaven to assist you, and we just ignore them. The whole spiritual warfare that's going on. And so one of the proofs and evidences that God's burden is your burden, the burden of proof, is that you pray for people. So three things we're going to look at today. When you pray for people and and there's many more, but we're going to look at three from this story. One, that you confess people's sin as though your forgiveness depended on it. <laughs> you confess their sin as though it's your sin and as though your forgiveness depended on it. Because you are uniting your hearts with their heart. Number two, you plead their case as though your future depended on it. Dear God, bless them as though their blessing is going to become your, their deliverance is going to become your deliverance. And number three, you participate in the solution as though the outcome depended on you. In other words, pray as hard as you can and help as much as you can. And we're going to see this in Nehemiah. Nehemiah, we're going to see, was a cup bearer to the king Artaxerxes. Now, give you a little history. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons. They became the nation of Israel. Um, the 12 tribes got split. Ten, two. Ten split off to the north, two to the south in Palestine. The ten in the north got taken captive to Assyria. The two in the south got taken captive to Babylon. I'm generalizing. Here's the story. They're in Babylon in captivity. And then they got released in three different stages to go back to Jerusalem. They got released to build a temple. They got released to have their own life. And Nehemiah is still in the place of their captivity. And, and he's going to hear news that the Jews that went back to Jerusalem are in distress. The wall is broken down. Now remember, they went back to build a temple. And in order to have Worship they, and protection and safety from their enemies, because there's still enemies there, they had to have a wall. And so the wall was bur- broken down, the gates were burnt, and they were under great distress. You're going to read that. We're going to read that in a minute. And then he is going to intercede for them. He's going to hear of this news and pray for them. Now, what's the point? The point is that when we hear of people hurting, your family, your friends, your neighbors, people around the world, and it breaks God's heart. Does it break your heart? Or do you go, that's too bad for them. <laughs> I ain't glad I ain't live over there. Man, that's messed up for them. I'm glad I live here. Hey, my, my, my friends live in New York where I grew up and I often tease them. And I'll FaceTime with them when it's 70 here and 30 degrees or 30 below or whatever they got back there. I tease them. That's a joke. But when they have hardship, my heart breaks for them. And so here's the question, here's the burden of proof, is that when you hear of other people who have a hardship, whether they are your people or not, whether they are your friends or not, do you pray for them? Do you, one, confess their sin as though your forgiveness depended on it? You know, Jesus not only, he didn't have to confess sin, he, he did more than that. He became our sin. <laughs> Think about that. He became our sin. He didn't say, look at them sinners over there, like what we do. He went, no, I'm going to actually become, not only become a person and struggle with the sin and, and the sinful nature, struggle with your circumstances and all that I am and, and conquer your sinful nature. I am going to come and actually become your sin. Jesus became the sin of murderers and racists. And every evil thing that we have, he actually embodied it while he died. And then he conquered it. Great news. He pleaded for us, which he does every day now. And then he participated in the solution. He became a man, lived, died, overcome it, and conquered our sin. 
His, his intercession was not only words, it was action. And so the proof that God's burden is your burden is that you're willing to identify with somebody's sin and plight, that you're willing to plead on their behalf that they will be delivered. Even people that you don't like, oh, snap. And that you are willing to become part of the solution, that they be delivered to Jesus. And so he, here he is. He, he's a cupbearer. We're going we're to talk about him. And he's got a very prestigious role in the palace. And he's going to hear about his people in Jerusalem. The wall is broken down. The wall is broken down. And he is going to have compassion for them to go back. But he's going to start by praying. Let's read. Chapter 1. It says, It came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year I was in Sushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are in great distress and reproach. Here's what, the thing, here's what he's hearing. My people are hurting. By the way, you may say, well, what about, he's praying for people who he likes. You know, the Bible said that we should pray for people who are our enemies as well. These principles apply to everybody. And then he says, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burned with fire. Here's the significance of that. They didn't have guns and radar and, you know, police. They had a wall. That was their protection. If you had a wall and a gate, that's how you kept the enemies out. Because they didn't have a wall, they had no protection. They were just getting bombarded by the enemies left and right, left and right, left and right. And he knew you have no, it's like, it's like, it's like your family living in a house in a hostile neighborhood and there's no doors on the house. You're like, oh, we got to get them doors. Real simple. There's no lock. Right? There's, the wind, there's no windows. It's just wide open. People, the, the enemies are coming in the house in, in your family. That's what he's hearing. And then it says, verse 4, so it was when I heard these words, look what he did. He sat down. He wept. He mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So here's what he's doing. He's going to sit down. Now understand, here's who he is. King Artaxerxes is the king. Nehemiah is a Jew. He is a cupbearer to the king. What does that mean? That because there were so many conspiracies trying to kill the leaders, they had cupbearers who would bear the cup and bring their cup of wine, which they drank, um, to the king. And they would drink it to make sure there was no poison in it. So the king trusted his life. Into the hands of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah was, had a very high position in the king's house. And if the king had guests over the house, Nehemiah had to make sure all the wine and all the food, everything was poison free. So his life was on the line. So just imagine someone who's saving your life every day, guaranteeing that your food and your, your, your wine is not poisoned. You got to trust that person. That's Nehemiah. He had great clout in the king's palace. And yet he hears this news of his people. Now he could have said, huh, too bad on them. I got a good job. I'm in the palace. I'm in the big house. <laughs> I, got, I got everything I need. I ain't, I, I ain't going to worry myself with that. Uh-uh. The Bible says he sat down, he wept, he prayed before the God of his heaven. And look what he says. Verse 5. I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive to your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now night and day for the children of Israel, your servants. Night and day. Man, God's burden became his burden. I don't know what kind of job you got. I don't know what kind of place you live. But wherever you're at, whatever job you have, there's a whole lot of people lower than you. Matter of fact, if you're on welfare in this country, in the United States of America, in Estados Unidos, if you're on welfare, you are in the top 15% of wealth in the world. That means 85% of the world is poorer than you. So for all y'all who are not on welfare, you're up higher than that. Just so you know. Just so you know. So I just want you to imagine you hear of the plight of people who are way worse than you. 
I ain't. I got mine. God, I want your burden to be my burden. Now, does that mean you're going to go help everybody in the world? That's impractical. You can't do that. But you can be open to whatever God wants. And here's what he did. He confessed their sin as though it was his. Look what it says. Confess. He says, I pray for you day and night. And then he says, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned before against you, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I, we have acted corruptly, very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. Um, Number one, if you are going to be a powerful intercessor, confess the sins of the people that you're praying for as though your forgiveness depended on it. Racism is a big issue in our country. And it's very easy to point to that person, that person, that person. I get it. Okay. Politics. Republican, Democrat, Democrat, Republican. Whatever you are, the other person's guilty. I get it. But what if you said this, Lord, please forgive me for any bias I have that I may not even know about. Please forgive me for having a selfish heart. Please forgive me for having a self-righteous heart. Please forgive me for my views and, and, and how I talk about this. Whatever it is that you're confessing about them, does that mean that you are as bad as them? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, Lord, before I cast stone, check my heart. Search my heart. Forgive me of my sin. The Bible says the eyes are deceitful and desperately wicked. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We always, it's so easy for us to do that, 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 that. But here's the thing. I'm not responsible for that person. I'm only responsible for me. So, Lord, and, 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 and my prayer isn't, Lord, get that person. My prayer is redeem that person. If you're a Republican, can you pray for Democrats to know God? If you're a Democrat, can you pray for Republicans to know God? Can you do that? Certainly if you do that publicly, you get canceled. If you do that, what the Bible says, publicly, people come against you because we live in this us versus them culture, but that's not the kingdom of God. That's not, that, 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 that proof that burden proves that you are about the world, not God. But the, burden of, the, the proof that God's burden is your burden is that you pray for everybody. And that you put yourself in their shoes. Ha, 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 ha. Nehemiah said, Lord, forgive me for my sin and my father's house. Forgive all of us. I'm putting myself in their boat. Because if I'm going to secure the blessing of God, the power of Nehemiah. If I'm going to secure the blessing of God, the power of God, and the ability to go help, which we're going to see in a minute. I got to be clean. I can't go in there, I'm right, you're wrong, let me be the savior, you know, let me, let me be your, your hope, your answer. No, no, I'm coming with the power of God and I got to get out of the way. So the first thing I'm going to do is confess. If God's burden is your burden, you will pray for other people. And one of the first things you're going to do is not only declare the glory of God, which is what he did, he definitely declared God's awesomeness, but then he confessed his own sin. As though... The whole success of the mission relied on him cleaning his heart. Then look what it says in verse 8. Then he says, remember I pray the word, he's talking to God. Remember I pray the word you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, I will keep my commandments and do them. Though some of you were cast out in the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather you from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. Number two, he pleaded their case as though his future depended on it. In other words, dear God, when you are praying for that person, 
You pray for that person as though your blessing depended on it. Don't pray this. Dear God, yeah, you know, they're, they're really messed up. And, you know, if you want to help them, fine. But if not, no, 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 no. You pray for them as though your blessing depended on them. Intercession is not saying, hey, God, you know, they're over there. Intercession is, Lord, I'm standing in their place. I am coming to you, God, on behalf of these people. I'm coming to you on behalf of these people. I'm coming to you on behalf of my friends. I'm coming to you on behalf of my enemies. I'm coming to you on behalf of the people who hate me. But I'm going to identify so much with them just as you did with me. I'm going to plead with you to bless them. Now watch this, watch this. You're not pleading that God bless evil people to do more evil. You are pleading with God that God restore their soul, that God deliver their soul, that God would, 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 would set them free of their sin and their crooked ways. That's what you're pleading. Dear God, you created them in the image. You love them. You have a great plan for their life. And I know they can be so productive. So can you please, please free them from their views and their attitude and their language and, and their addictions and their, and, and their criminal ways. Please deliver them. Huh? Because don't act like you ain't ever did anything wrong. And don't act like, now maybe I don't know you, I know you've done stuff wrong because we're all sinners, but don't act like you don't know people who've done some horrible things that are really good people. And I might mean by good people that they're jacked up in what they're doing, but they're made in the image of God. And when you have seen people who have done horrible things be transformed into amazing people, don't tell me you've never seen it happen. And you never want to get to the point where you throw people away and say they're hopeless, ever. Because God don't make junk. Every person he's ever created is redeemable. So if God's burden is yours, that all will be saved. If God's burden is yours, that all would walk with him and know him and repent. You would step in as an intercessor and pray. Confess their sin as though your forgiveness depended on it. Plead for their case as though your future depended on it. And number three. Participate in the solution as though the outcome depended on you. In other words, in everything we do, look, pray and then go to work. Don't pray and sit around and just wait for God to drop it out of the sky. In other words, dear God, get me a job and then sit home and wait for someone to call you. No, get the best resume, be on time, <laughs> hit the streets, <laughs> you know, hustle. <laughs> you pray hard and then you work hard. Those two things go together. You don't pray hard and just sit around. And so if you're going to pray for this person, you want to pray for them and say, God, what do you want me to do? And look what it says. Look what it says. It says in verse 10, 11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to, to the prayer of your servant. He's calling himself a servant, by the way. Ha, he's a servant. He's got a very prestigious role in the kingdom. Uh, uh, well, in the, in the kingdom of that country. With the king. He's right here with the king. Save his life every day. King trusted him. King confided in him. King trusted his friends, in his, the lives of his friends in his, in, his, in his hand. This guy, Nehemiah, could have killed everybody. But he trusts him so much. And he's saying, I'm just a servant of God. Hey, you may be the CEO of a big company. You're just a servant of God. That's it. And here's what he says. Verse 11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him me mercy in the sight of this man, the king, if I was the king's cupbearer. Number three, participate in the solution as though the outcome depended on you. In other words, Nehemiah is sitting there going, I hear my people's polite. I hear that the walls are broken down, the gates are burned with fire, they have no protection, they, they're, they're getting vandalized, they're getting harassed, and, and after all these years, they're still struggling. I'm in the big house eating good food, drinking good wine and, and, and partying with the, with the big boys, and then I hear this, and I'm like, nah, 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 nah. I got to get involved. So he says, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me for my sin. I don't know what his sin was. It could be that he just thought he was better. I don't know what his sin was. But please forgive my sin. Lord, I beg you, give me mercy and, and help my people. And then he says, Lord, grant me favor 
in the eyes of the king because what I'm going to do is put my job on the line for my people. And I'm going to ask the king to let me go back and help. And I'm going to ask the king to help me. I'm putting it all in line. Here, here's what I would encourage you to do. Pick a friend or an enemy if you really want to be challenged. If you really want to be blessed, pick somebody that you have a relationship with that doesn't like you. Or a group of people that's opposite in you in their views of, of uh, social justice or, or politics or religion. Someone opposite you. And they have a problem. And step in and start praying for them. Ho, ho! <laughs> Come on now. Now, you may not be ready there. You may be like, well, let me just start with my kids. Okay, you can start there. But if you really want to step into some big boy stuff and put on your big boy pants, Christian, say, who is out there that I can pray for? Now, you're not praying that their view or they would do something to hurt you, but you are praying that God would redeem their soul. And say, Lord, you know, I've been talking about this person and these kind of people. Maybe I have something I have to learn. Maybe... I can pray that they would see you more clearly. Maybe there's something I can do to help facilitate that. Because at the end of the day, never pray for something you are not open to allowing God to use you to fix. Dear God, please bless the homeless people. But don't use me. Don't ever pray that. Dear God, please bless those black people, those white people, those rich people, those poor people, those immigrants. But don't use me. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. God, I pray for them. And if you want to use me, I'm here. Whoa. Watch out. If you do that, watch out. Nehemiah said, I'm going to the king. I'm a cupbearer. And I'm putting it all in line. Make a long story short, he went to Jerusalem and he built the wall in 52 days. This is a miracle. Miraculous. You read, read the book. Here's my encouragement to you. God wants to help you. He wants to bless you. I want to pray for you. And I want to give you an opportunity to say, Lord, I want to confess my sin. Lord, I want to plead blessing on my life. And Lord, I'm willing to do for me what I need to walk with God. So I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Christ. But you have to act. I'm standing in the gap before you right now, but you have to respond. Because if someone prays for you and God starts acting on your behalf, then now it's on you to respond. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray on behalf of the people listening. I always say every week that all have sinned, and it's true, but that also includes me. So I pray you forgive me of my sin, forgive me of my pride, my arrogance, and that nothing about me would get in the way of them hearing your message. And I plead on their behalf that they would hear your voice, that they would trust you with their life. As you're listening, if you would like Christ to be your Savior, pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I'm a sinner. I confess that. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to bless me. I ask you to fill me with the Spirit of God. I surrender my life to you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, hit the save button or text save to 52525. We want to help you in your journey. But let me encourage you. One of the burdens of proof, the evidence that God's burden is your burden, is that you would pray for other people. I challenge you this week, get one person, start praying for them, and watch what happens in your heart. God bless you. If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. 
and then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, Dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we want to know and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you and we'll see you in heaven.